Okay, we left off on page 123, so that's where we're going to begin. The Grunt. I was born in a place humans call Central Africa, in a dense rainforest so beautiful no crayons could ever do it justice. Gorillas don't name their newborns right away, the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what might yet be. When they saw how much loved, how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided on my twin sister's name, Tag. Oh, how I loved to play tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap onto my unsuspecting father. Then I would join her and we would pounce on that tolerant belly until he gave us the grunt, the rooting pig sound that meant enough. That game never got old, although my father might have disagreed. Mud. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark and on my poor mother's back. I used the sap from leaves. I used the juice from fruit, but mostly I used mud. That's what, what, that is what they called me, mud. To a human, mud not might sound, let me start over that. To a human, mud might not sound like much, but to me, it was everything. Protector. My family, which humans call a troop, was just like any other gorilla family. There were 10 of us, my father, the silverback, my mother, and three other adult females, a juvenile male called blackba Blackback, and two other young gorillas. Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then as families will, but my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl. Scowl is like this. And for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do, to feed and forage and nap and play. My father was a master at leading us to the ripest fruit for our morning feast and the finest branches for our night nests. He was everything a silverback is meant to be, a guide, a teacher, a protector, and nobody could chest beat like my father chest beat like this. A perfect life. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different except that a gorilla gets to spend their day riding on his mother's back like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system from the baby's point of view. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture farther and farther away from the safety of his mother's arms. He learns the skills he will need as an adult how to make a nest of branches, weave them tightly or they will fall apart in the middle of the night, how to beat your chest, cup your palms to your to amplify the sound, like this, how to go vining from tree to tree, don't let go, and how to be kind, strong, and loyal. Growing up gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes, you play, you learn, you do it all over again. And it was for a while, a perfect life. The end. One day, a still day when the hot air hummed, the humans came. Vine. After they captured my sister and me, they put us in a cramped dark crate that smelled of urine and fear. Somehow I knew that in order to live, I had to let my old life die. But my sister could not let go of our home. It held her like a vine, stretching across the miles, comforting, strangling. We were still in our crate when she looked at me without seeing, and I knew that the vine had finally snapped. So when they say she looked without seeing, so her, she had died with her eyes open. The temporary human. It was Mac who pried open that crate. Mac who bought me. Mac who raised me like a human baby. I wore diapers. I drank from a bottle. I slept in human beds, sat in human chairs, listened while human words swarmed around me like angry bees. 
Mac had a wife back then. Helen was quick to laugh, but quick to anger too, especially when I broke something, which was often. Here is what I broke while I lived with Mac and Helen. One crib, 46 glasses, seven lamps, one couch, three shower curtains, three shower curtain rods, one blender, one TV, one radio, and three toes, my own. I broke the blender when I squeezed two tubes of toothpaste and a bottle of glue into it. I broke my toes attempting to swing from a lamp fixture on the ceiling. I broke 46 glasses. Well, it turns out there are many ways to break glass. Every weekend, Mac and Helen took me in their convertible to a fast food restaurant where they ordered me french fries and a strawberry shake. Mac loved to see the expression on the cashier's face when he drove up and said, Can I have some extra ketchup for my kid? I went to baseball games, to the grocery store, to a movie theater, and even to the circus. They didn't have a gorilla. I rode a little motorbike and blew out candles on my birthday cake. My life as a human was a glamorous one, although my parents, traditional sorts, would not have approved. His gorilla parents, he means. Uh, there he is. Hunger. In my new life as a human, I was well tended. I ate lettuce leaves with Thousand Island dressing and caramel apples and popcorn with butter. My belly ballooned. But hunger, like food, comes in many shapes and colors. At night, lying alone in my Winnie the Pooh pajamas, I felt hungry for the skilled touch of a grooming friend for the cheerful grunts of a play fight, for the easy safety of my nearby troop, foraging through shadows. Remember what happened to Tag, I told myself. Don't think about the jungle. But some, still, sometimes I lay awake, wishing for the warmth of another just like me, asleep in a night nest of tender prayer plant leaves. I liked having sips of soda poured into my mouth, like a bubbling waterfall, but now and then, every now and then, I long to search for a tender stalk of arrowroot, to feel the tease of a mango just out of reach. One day, Helen came home with something large and flat, wrapped in brown paper. Oh, I'm sorry, the title of this chapter is called Still Life. One day, Helen came home with something large and flat, wrapped in brown paper. Look what I bought today, she said excitedly as she tore off the paper. A painting to go over the living room couch. Fruit and a bowl, Max said with a shrug. Big deal. This is fine art. It is called a still life, Helen explained, and I think it's lovely. I dashed over to examine the painting, marveling at the shapes and colors. See, said Max's wife, Ivan likes it. Ivan likes to roll up poop and throw it at squirrels, Max said. I couldn't take my eyes off the apples and bananas and grapes in the picture. They look so real, so inviting, so edible. That means something that can be eaten. I reached out to touch a grape and Helen slapped my hand. Bad boy, Ivan, don't touch. She jerked her thumb at Mac. Honey, go get a hammer and a nail, would ya? Well, while Mac and Helen were busy in the living room, I wandered into the kitchen. A cake covered in thick chocolate frosting sat on the counter. I love cake. Love it, in fact, but I wasn't eating. I was thinking about it. It was painting. The frosting peaked and dipped like waves on a tiny pond. It looked rich and gooey, dark and smooth. <laughs> it looked like mud. Uh-oh. I scooped up a handful of frosting and I scooped up another and I headed to the refrigerator door. Oh, it was perfect. An empty, white, waiting canvas. The frosting wasn't as easy to work with as jungle mud. It was stickier and, of course, more tempting to eat. 
but I kept at it. I scraped off every last bit of that frosting. I may have eaten a little cake too. I don't remember what I was trying to paint. A banana most likely. I suppose I knew I was going to get in trouble. But at that moment, I just didn't care. I wanted to make something, anything the way I used to. I wanted to be an artist again. And we're gonna stop there, it was on page 137. I'll do one more video today and I'll upload these to YouTube as soon as I am done.